Welcome everybody to the JVS Vascular Science webinar. Uh, this uh, webinar, uh, we have a topic of aneurysms and uh, will be moderated by our associate editor, Dr. Jose Diaz. Uh, before we begin though, I'm gonna ask our uh, assistant editor, Dr. Paul DiMuzio to introduce the ground rules of the webinar. Dr. DiMuzio. Thank you, Alan. I hope you can hear me. Privileged to help out today. Just wanted to ask everybody to stay muted during the presentations. And as the presentations move along, if you have any questions or comments, please post to the, to the chat so that our moderators can pick them up and uh, pose the uh, questions. Um, we've started the recording, um, so please be aware of that. Um, it'll also be published later on, so those who have missed it can also view the recording. And lastly, just in the future, please look out for uh, other free uh, journal vascular surgery, vascular science webinars. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back to you, Alan, and uh, great to be here. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Glovitsky to give a little word of welcome, please. Dr. Glovitsky, our JVS Editor-in-Chief. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, everybody. Good morning and uh, good afternoon, wherever you are. We have an amazing program, truly international, with a great lecture. We are excited that uh, uh, JVSVS organizes this seminar and we are excited to have JVSVS as the fourth uh, journal of the JVS family. So uh, uh, let's go on, uh, Alan, and uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Uh, first, let me just introduce uh, Dr. Jose Diaz, our associate editor, who uh, is a uh, vascular surgeon scientist uh, at Vanderbilt, uh, known for his work for animal models and in venous disease especially. Uh, he helps run the American Venus Forum Day of Science and is well known to be a real innovative researcher. And he's our host for today, Dr. Diaz. Thank you very much, uh, Alan. Uh, I appreciate the introduction. Um, today we have a very interesting program. Um, you will see a commonality of, uh, that we will develop um, this program thinking in, in AAA, but pointed point out that it will be uh, based on modeling, which uh, it will come on each of these uh, talks. The first talk, the title is patient-specific computational flow modeling for assessing hemodynamic changes following fenestrated endovascular aneurysm repair. And um, it will be presented by Dr. Tran, which is currently a fifth year resident in integrated vascular surgery at Stanford University. He's currently conducting research under um, NIH T32 training grant um, in the labs of Dr. Lee and Martin. Prior to the medical training, he was a biomedical engineer with experience in medical imaging. His research interests involve application of computational fluids dynamics modeling methods to investigate hemodynamics after complex endovascular aneurysm repair. Dr. Tran, take it away. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction, Dr. Diaz, and for the JVSVS editorial board for reviewing and publishing our manuscript and also uh, allowing us the privilege to highlight our work in this webinar. Um, first, just a, a bit of background. Computational studies in general have become much faster and, and cheaper to perform as uh, computational efficiency has really grown on a logarithmic scale over the past several decades. And I like to use Formula One racing as a nice real world example of uh, how CFD can be applied to, to a real world setting where CFD studies have largely replaced traditional expensive wind tunnel testing for improving racing car performance. And they actually spend millions of dollars per year uh, in their annual budgets for this. And a nice uh, visual example is the introduction of a component in the front wing called a cascade deflector. And you can see here based on CFD studies, how 
uh, a cascade deflect results in greatly reduced aerodynamic drag over the front wheels uh, compared to those without the cascade. And that led us to think, you know, how we can how can we apply similar methods to complex EVAR, which often results in large changes in aortic geometry shown here. Uh, this is an example, as, as everyone I think in this talk is aware, fenestrated EVAR with a flared renal graft. But uh, we still are really in the infancy of understanding how these structural changes can influence either branch perfusion or downstream hemodynamics. So our study objectives were to develop a computational flow simulation or CFS pipeline for evaluating hemodynamic changes uh, after fenestrated EVAR. And to do this in the context of a pilot study of 10 retrospectively selected at our institution, uh, patients treated with juxtarenal AAAs uh, with the Cook ZFEN device. And just a brief overview of our overall computational framework. Uh, we use an open source platform called SimVascular, which was a homespun uh, developed program at the Stanford Computational Biomechanics Lab by one of my mentors, Dr. Marsden. Uh, we take uh, clinical data, including pre and post-op CTAs, uh, patient hemodynamics, body surface area, and use those to create uh, tailored patient-specific uh, inflow and outflow uh, waveform conditions. Uh, we then use these to generate uh, flow simulations where we can derive relevant hemodynamic parameters and also visualize uh, flow in 3D. Uh, our specific uh, pipeline is uh, not particularly unique to our study, but uh, in terms of uh, how we uh, are able to model the renal flares, we first create paths down the aorta and its branches. Uh, we then uh, manually segment 2D contours along the path. These are then lofted into 3D models, and then we use a multi-scale uh, finite element mesh uh, with finer mesh in areas of uh, region of interest, such as the branch and the paravisceral aorta here. Uh, for boundary conditions, we use a scaled, uh, allometrically scaled, the patient body surface area, uh, pulsatile inflow waveform. This has been previously validated by prior studies in patients with infrarenal AAAs uh, based on a 4D MRI. Uh, outlet boundary conditions are then tuned to match the uh, patient's blood pressure and compliance. Uh, we then perform pulsatile, non-compressible, rigid wall uh, flow simulations using their built-in uh, Navier-Stokes equation solver. Uh, for this particular study, uh, we evaluated 10 patients uh, treated with the Cook ZFEN device, and we took care to uh, select patients with a variety of graph diameters, as well as uh, a variety of inferior uh, neck angulation. And uh, this is just an overview of all the patients that we modeled in our study. And then I'll, we'll just pick one kind of representative patient. Uh, this is a patient with a six centimeter annuals with a very highly angulated inferior neck. Uh, so we were interested in this patient that had a relatively small diameter graph, 24 millimeters uh, placed here, uh, that had significant protrusion in the renal flares, as you can see in the top right corner, and also highlighted here, and how these geometric changes uh, influence branch hemodynamics. Uh, so for this particular patient, uh, we saw an increase in both uh, pressure, which is uh, represented in the blue lines here, uh, solid lines represent the post-operative state and the dotted lines, the pre-operative state. Um, so both in the proximal and the distal uh, aorta, we saw an increase in uh, aortic pressure and also flow rate distally. For the mesenteric perfusion, uh, this patient did have a significant decrease in celiac and SMA perfusion pressure. And uh, interestingly, uh, we kind of hypothesized that you know, adding in significant renal flares, especially in a 24 millimeter graph would decrease renal perfusion, but actually in this patient, because of the angulation change, uh, it looked like the renal artery pressure and flow rates uh, increased postoperatively on both sides. Uh, in aggregate, uh, we didn't find uh, any uh, large changes in uh, branch pressure between patients, but we did observe small statistically significant differences when you uh, conducted paired analysis for proximal aortic pressure, renal pressure, and renal flow rates. But again, I think uh, the importance of the CFS studies are emphasizing per patient changes uh, that may not you know, uh, uh, 
represent like an average change across everybody. But if you have a specific patient geometry, uh, the CFD can, can really reveal uh, quite significant branch uh, changes after repair. Uh, we also uh, visualize wall shear stress in the branches. Uh, here are uh, wall shear stress contour maps with red areas showing supraphysiologic wall shear stress and blue areas uh, uh, in the branches showing subphysiologic wall shear stress. And really we saw uh, very variable changes, especially in the renal artery branches. In this example, you can see that postoperatively there was uh, improved areas where there was less areas of supraphysiologic shear stress. Uh, this patient seemed to have higher wall shear stress postoperatively, and this patient didn't really have any change. Uh, and again, uh, because those differences were so variable, we did not see any aggregate changes in branch wall shear stress uh, when looking at these uh, values on paired analysis. Uh, next, uh, we performed a 2D visualization of uh, pulse cell flow. Um, and this is the same as the example patient where you can see a relatively small aortic lumen with uh, large uh, uh, protruding renal flares. And you can see here in this, in this uh, highlighted area at the white box, uh, there's significant flow disturbance uh, with lower velocity magnitude than you see in the preoperative state. And again, the same patient, uh, this is now showing vorticity or particle spin. Uh, you can imagine it as a red blood cell uh, rotational forces. Uh, and during the uh, cardiac cycle, you can see just inferior to the renal flares, there's this large area of red, which indicates a higher uh, uh, red blood cell uh, uh, spin associated with the renal flares. And in general, these values are more indicative of turbulent flow as opposed to laminar flow, as you can see above the, the uh, renal arteries here. So in conclusion, uh, CFD provides computational evidence supporting differentiated EVAR with no uh, aggregate adverse uh, renal visceral hemodynamics following graft placement. Uh, there does appear to be a small increase in peak renal artery perfusion postoperatively, at least in the context of our pilot study. And uh, CFD modeling is also a very powerful tool for assessing hemodynamic performance at a patient-specific level. And I'll just end here um, just in terms of uh, uh, going back to the first analogy where F1 cars have really uh, developed over the years and have become faster. And as they've become faster, the flow patterns are a lot more intricate. And kind of likewise, as we progress from standard bifurcated devices to four vessel fenestrated devices to multi-branch and off the shelf devices, uh, human dynamics are bound to become more complex. And uh, I hope that uh, these kind of computational methods can elucidate and increase our understanding of, of, of flow changes after complex EVAR and hopefully uh, one day be used to optimize graph design on a patient specific level. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to thank my mentors, Dr. Allison Marsden and Jason Lee for their ongoing support and happy to take any, any questions. Thank you very much, Ken. I, great imaging. I, I enjoy a lot your presentation. Um, we have a couple of uh, questions. Um, I will go with the first one. Uh, previous studies using um, this computational flow simulation methods are extremely um, limited to a small sample size, less than 10. Uh, how much computational um, time does each simulation take is, uh, is the question for the first one. And if you uh, envision patient-specific CDF models being developed in real time in a clinical setting. Yeah, thank you for the question. I think, so uh, we have fortunately have access to very high speed uh, computational clusters at our university and they take somewhere in the six to eight hour range per simulation. And that would need to be done on the preoperative anatomy and the postoperative anatomy. So not really something that can be done in real time, but certainly as these methods progress and the and processing power increases, I think one day we'll be able to reach a state where you can potentially see a patient in clinic and then you know that evening run some studies uh, before tailoring their graph design. That would be the hope. That, that is very interesting. Let me read another question to you, uh, Alan. Do, you, uh, do we have time? 
yeah, we are okay with time, right? All right, so can these studies can be constructed solely uh, with non-invasive data such as uh, CTA or, or is invasive data such as uh, arterial blood pressure required? Sorry, uh, can you repeat that question? I, I missed the first part. So this type of studies can be constructed solely with non-invasive data such as CTA? Yes, it, the, the anatomy can be, can be segmented with CTA. For the inflow waveforms, uh, the, the validated studies, you use something called 4D MRI. Uh, that basically, like kind of like an MRI, you can derive time of flight data uh, and, and visualize an inflow and outflow velocity waveform. Uh, those studies are, are expensive and not routinely done clinically. So we didn't really use those and they weren't accessible for our study. I think the general framework would be, you know, as uh, these studies gain more traction as you do a larger scale validated study with 40 MRI and then kind of fine tune your, your ability to, to create um, accurate physiologic waveform from from CTAs and uh, perhaps an echo or duplex imaging um, that aren't quite as expensive as MRIs. I see. Um, interesting question also here. Um, how do you compare computational models? Uh, I mean, what is happening in real life? Uh, are, um, or what, what, what are the ways to validate the computational models? I think this is the summary for the question. Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a couple of different ways that people validate their models. Um, one again is the 4D MRI, but that one, uh, you can't really drive pressure. So uh, the next way to do it would be invasive studies, either uh, most likely would have to be done during an operation where you put a small, you know, uh, uh, three French, four French catheter uh, to measure pressure in the aorta and its branches. And then you can use that data uh, retrospectively to either tune your boundary conditions um, uh, or and, and potentially use that to create uh, post-operative uh, you know simulation data but I, I think it would be hard to to subject a patient to that pre-operatively just to get relevant pressure and and uh, and and velocity waveforms so still kind of trying to figure out what the best way to implement that that um, intervention. We need to move along, but I would like to squeeze a little question, one more question. Um, so, regarding, um, have you done late exams and compare one to the other one to see if you get the same data in a patient? Or and another question in the same setting is, can you predict uh, formation, thrombus formation? Uh, yeah, so that, that's a great question. Thank you for, uh, for squeezing those in. So for the uh, first, uh, I'll answer the second question first, because that one is uh, more uh, a kind of a recent development in our lab. We can predict uh, thrombus development within the graft uh, and also uh, renal stent occlusion. And that actually will be presenting at the upcoming VRIP conference at the VAM this year. Um, as, as a lot of people who do these procedures know, there's about a 10 or 20% risk of, of renal branch re-intervention. Um, so I think that's a, an important finding and, and kind of uh, is an extension of Dr. Boyd's work uh, in uh, predicting thrombus formation in, in ruptured triplase that she published in the JBS a couple of years ago. Um, and then, oh, sorry, the first question, remind me again. Uh, it was um, um, regarding if you have taken. Oh, yeah, yeah, pre and post op. So uh, exactly. we have not done uh, post, like, for, like, compared the immediate post operative to, let's say, a five year or 10 year follow up uh, to see if there are any flow changes related to the geometry, kind of as the aorta remodels, but certainly it's something that we can do um, um, later on in future studies. Thank you, Ken. I really appreciate it. Uh, congratulations, and uh, I want to remind everybody that these are three papers uh, that we selected today um, that it will be published in JDS uh, Vascular Science. The second talk, the title is Increased um, uh, MMP9's Activity Correlated with Flow-Mediated Intraluminal Thrombus Deposition 
and world degeneration in human abdominal aortic aneurysm. Um, the presenter is Dr. Dukas, which is currently uh, practicing vascular surgery at uh, Ontario. She completed her general surgery and master of surgery at the University of uh, Manitoba. This is uh, where she became interested in vascular surgery and started her research of um, aortic aneurysm. Um, she then uh, went to complete the, her fellowship in uh, of vascular surgery at the University of Western Ontario. So Dr. Dukas, please. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to present my research I did trying to further our understanding at why aneurysms grow in rupture. Currently, vascular surgeons repair aneurysms based on size, 5.5 centimeters for men and five centimeters for women. This isn't perfect because we see aneurysms rupturing below the threshold and those that grow well beyond it. What we do know is it starts with the degradation of collagen elastin, the load-bearing substances in the median adventitia. This is through an inflammatory process. There are four proposed mechanisms for this currently. Proteolytic degradation through matrix metalloproteinases, specifically MMP9. Now these are zinc endopeptidases that are remodeling enzymes that become dysregulated in disease states. There's inflammatory response, as well as biomechanical wall shear stress, as we recently learned, and molecular genetics of the patients. Based on a study done at our center, looking at patients who had CT scans done at rupture uh, and fluid models generated, we found that the rupture occurred in areas of low wall shear stress, low velocity recirculation zones. This was contrary to the fluid mechanic model at the time, which thought that rupture occurred at the impingement high stress zones of the aorta. We wanted to look at thrombus, proteolytic factors, inflammation, as well as wall shear stress to better understand what was going on in these aortas. We enrolled patients who were undergoing abdominal aortic aneurysm repair that was open. Risk factors and data was collected at the time that consent was obtained. They had CT scans and computational fluid models, as well as modeling of their thrombus were generated. At the time of surgery, full thickness aortic tissue samples were harvested. These samples were analyzed. The samples were looking at collagen and elastin, inflammation, as well as MMP9, total and active. All the data was analyzed together and compared. When we looked at the computational fluid studies, we found that there were three types of aneurysms, those with eccentric thrombus, which was the majority of them and is shown on the screen, uh, where thrombus predominated in one portion of the aorta, those with circumferential thrombus, where there was one flow channel, and those devoid of thrombus at all. Now, when we looked at the flow through these aortas, we found that there was increased thrombus deposition in areas of low wall shear stress and low velocity. This was statistically significant. We then looked at thrombus, MMP9, inflammation, as well as collagen and elastin in the tissue. What we found is that as compared to controls, there was increased collagen and there was decreased collagen and elastin in areas of high thrombus and increased inflammation. When we looked at MMP9 total and active, we found that in areas of high MMP9, there was less collagen and less elastin. This was statistically significant in both cases. When we were looking at patients who had eccentric thrombus and comparing it to total concentration of MMP9 within the tissue at those locations, we found that areas of high intraluminal thrombus correlated with high levels of MMP9. When we look specifically at all the patients that had eccentric thrombus, there was quite a bit more MMP9 in the locations of high thrombus. This was statistically significant. This was the first study to incorporate thrombus, inflammation, proteolytic enzymes, as well as wall stress and velocity within aortic aneurysms. Our population of aortic aneurysms was the same as most populations of aortic aneurysms. What we found was that there was marked variability of MMP9 in aortic aneurysms, that in areas of high thrombus, there was higher MMP9, lower collagen and elastin, and increased inflammation. In areas of recirculation, there was higher amounts of uh, intraluminal thrombus, 
as well as the recirculation in high thrombus was associated with higher concentrations in the tissue of MMP9. This was the first study to correlate in human aortic tissue flow and stress within the aorta with intraluminal thrombus as well as tissue MMP9 levels. The ultimate goal of this work is to develop a more precise model for the risk of rupture to possibly explain why there's continued expansion in EVAR and as well elucidate a target that we could use in high risk aneurysms. I want to thank you very much for allowing me to present my work and also Dr. April Boyd and David Kuhn. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lucas. I also enjoy your presentation. Um, it's very interesting how um, this uh, data um, is showing that low shear stress and, and, and the wall of show low shear stress are related to rupture. Uh, there are a couple of questions and I will try to see if we can um, answer those. Um, can you postulate a mechanism why MMP9s uh, um, are present at the high levels in areas of uh, increased uh, ILT? Yeah, uh, I think it has to do with the inflammatory process. So in areas of intra increased intraluminal thrombus, there is more hypoxia there, which can lead to inflammation, activation of cytokines, as well as I think dysregulation of the MMPs in their state, less tissue inhibitors of the MMPs. So you have oxidative stress, which increases inflammation and then develops, I, I think, increases the amount of MMP9s within the tissue and MMPs in total. So somehow you are uh, trying to say that the thrombus also induce this type of mechanism. Yeah, we know that thrombus induces local oxidative stress in the wall of the aorta as the aorta gets the majority of its oxygen from the lumen. So I think because there's increased inflammation in those areas, you're gonna see dysregulation of normally present endopeptidases. So things that remodel the aorta becoming dysregulated and producing too much and not being downregulated. Yeah, that is a very interesting concept. I was working in the bus with uh, one of our residents in rats and uh, it was interesting to see the, the thrombus and the relationship with the wall. We were interested in inflammation and interleukin-6 just in case. I threw that interlocutor in six to you guys because it's, it was very interesting. Um, uh, another question is, uh, what do you think is the next step on this uh, line of research? I think the next step is to look at more mediators. More, there is many more MMP9s. There's cytokines. They're all in that are all involved in the development of aneurysms and what kind of causes them in some aortas to grow quicker. So looking at more of the mediators that cause that, possibly looking at the patient's own genetics, as well as looking at the 4D MRI. So basically real-time modeling of the aorta to get a more accurate representation of the flow and the stress that is felt within the aorta at different locations. Uh, I have a quick, quick question. Uh, why MMP9s and no others? So I think this was the first research. MMP9 has been well studied both in thoracic aneurysms as well as abdominal aneurysms as one of the MMPs that is most present in aneurysm tissue. It's also most present within the patient's serum. Uh, so based on that, we wanted to start small and look specifically at MMP9 and then I think branch out and go from there and see how it interacts with all the other MMPs. That's, that's a great answer, and I appreciate that because it's interesting what happened with the rest, but it's good what you said, go first to that point because it's very one well Italian known. Congratulations, I like that. Thank um, you. But do we have time for more? one more question or we need, can we? Okay, so uh, I will try to read from the chat. When was CFD analysis and ILT reconstruction done compared to open repair and tissue harvest? So, all of the, uh, uh, the CFT analysis was done prior to the repair, and that was done within a month of the surgery, which is how most uh, aneurysms are repaired within Canada. So as soon as you have a diagnosis of an aneurysm that needs to be repaired, it usually is repaired within a month if you're going, undergoing open repair. Hmm. Based on your results, uh, one of the questions asked, uh, can, can we use MMP9s as a predictive marker for rupture? 
They have looked at serum MMP9 to see if there is a, a prediction with rupture. Currently, I mean, you're not going to be harvesting people's tissue before <laughs> their rupture. So currently there isn't an accurate way of predicting rupture, at least with MMP9 right now, yes. with what we know currently. So I think it's just gathering more information to see if we can eventually identify a target. That is, that is a great answer also, uh, and because, uh, yeah, circulate. Circulate, in circulation, MMP9s are even um, difficult. Um, uh, you do seismography for, uh, to determine the MMP9s in tissue? Uh, so we use a bioplex immunoassay to like, oh. we, we freeze the tissue in liquid nitrogen and then send it yeah. to a lab where it generates the concentration within the tissue. Yeah. I see. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dukas. I, I appreciate your presentation very much. I enjoy it. The third talk is uh, translating uh, mouse models of abdominal aortic aneurysm to the translational needs of vascular surgery. This will be presented by Dr. Uh, Busch, senior consultant vascular surgeon in uh, Dresden, uh, Germany. He's fellow of the European Board of Vascular Surgery, um, got MD and PhD degrees from University of uh, Würzburg. Uh, he performed two years postdoc at the Karolinska Institute in, in Sweden. And um, he is working on with small and large animal models of AAA for translational research in drug report, reporting and uh, RNA therapeutics. Uh, Dr. Bush. Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Diaz, for the introduction. It's uh, very kind and I'm very happy to present our paper. We've been asked to write a review actually on, on mouse models. And uh, I'll be using that to sort of um, give some, some bullet points and our opinions, our experience here, and also share with you some work. I hope you can see my screen now. And the paper has been published in, in the Journal of Vascular uh, Surgery, Vascular Science in March. We're very happy about that. And uh, just to start off, uh, most of you are, of course, in the field of aneurysm research, so you know. Um, all that stuff that this normal architecture within the normal aorta uh, with the course of time changes rapidly. And of course, we have those from, from human samples, from open repairs, from intact and ruptured aneurysms, um, as my predecessor already talked about. And we know that there is fibrosis going on. There is some different hemodynamics. We've heard about uh, possible thrombus activities. There is some, some proteolytic imbalance going on, uh, possibly overexpression of, of the MMP9s, for example. Um, we do see some antigenesis going on in those aneurysms. Um, and we know there is some sort of immune answer that might be helpful um, to actually condemn the process um, or not. So that's uh, basically what we know from human disease. And this is, of course, trying to be mimicked within, within mice. And, um, I guess you will all agree that we've seen a lot of good, um, of good clinical studies, but this is maybe some of you have even been uh, part of those studies. They've been reviewed a couple of times, but I guess we can all agree that there is a huge uh, translational gap um, in, those, in those clinical studies and actually taking uh, what we know from basic science in the lab and then taking these substances uh, to clinics and um, we think that some of this might actually be due um, to the mouse models that are used here. And I'm just going to introduce um, a bit of those mouse models based on uh, their changes to the aorta. So you can see here the normal mouse aorta which has about four layers of, of elastic fibers so a bit less than the human aid. And the human aorta, it's about half a millimeter thick. Many of you may have worked uh, with mice models before. And then I guess most of you are aware of this so-called calcium chloride model where you expose the aorta and you put calcium chloride on the aorta. And over this course um, of uh, four weeks, you can see some aneurysmatic dilation, some inflammation going on. Uh, we'll be coming back to this in more detail. Then, of course, there is the very famous and most frequently used angiotensin II model. You can also see a cross section here. Um, so, after implanting, um, after implanting this osmotic mini pump in mice and administering angiotensin II to, to hyper uh, lipidemic mice, they get this dissection sort of aneurysm. You can see that in most cases, the 
the, the actual media is still very much intact and we do see this large uh, intramural thrombus, actually this large dissection going on in these um, animals. One model that has um, also been frequently used in the past is the so-called PPE model. So the intra the, the perfusion with porcine uh, pancreatic elastase. Um, you have to surgically manipulate the aorta, which is kind of challenging. And you have to put the elastase inside the aorta. But those mice do actually get nice aneurysms. And we do see a couple of features here that are very human-like. And uh, throughout the last 10 years, um, something that has come up is putting the elastase not inside the aorta, but putting elastase outside um, of the aorta. And you will also get this nice aneurysmatic dilation. And you can enhance those models um, with this cross-linking or anti-cross-linking agent. And you will actually see some ruptures. You will see some intraluminal thrombus. Um, the BAPN can also be used in the angiotensin. A two model, of course, and we'll also come back to that. So to make our point, and this is a very busy slide, so I will just take uh, some time to get you through it. I saw you in the beginning that what we know from human disease is, of course, a very chronic state of disease. So all those features I introduced in the beginning um, are from a chronic stage of disease. And uh, this is here in the graph shown in light gray. So we have this sort of exponential growth of the human aneurysm. And then looking at the four different mouse models that I just introduced, um, sorry to go back one slide, um, you can see that they all at different time points. First of all, none of these actually grow in an exponential way. They would all grow in this more linear way and actually lose uh, speed again. And from very different stages of those models, so uh, time point zero is the induction of the aneurysm, and then you have the course of four weeks. You know that there are distinct changes in the PPE model going on happening here. There are distinct changes in the angiotensin model in a timely manner. There are very distinct changes also in the calcium chloride model and um, also in the remaining models. I'm not going into detail here. Um, you can all read this in the manuscript, and of course, I'm also happy to, to answer questions on these, but something that is very important, uh, what we think is to actually choose the right point for intervention in using those models to actually um, uh, apply some medications here. So uh, I guess most of you are aware that most studies actually induce the aneurysm and then very early also start to give some sort of drug. To, to start some sort of treatment, which basically most of the models just means that you that you basically treat acute inflammation um, that is happening here, and you don't actually treat the aneurysm features going on here. Um, and we uh, think that starting at later time points, starting at day seven, starting at day ten, you're losing a lot of this aneurysm growing dynamic, but you're treating more accurately actually features that also happen in the human disease. And I will just uh, take the last slide to show some work. Just uh, before this webinar, actually, we got, the, we got the confirmation that this work will now also be published soon. Um, so we've been using this PPE model. And you can see the normal growth curve of those PPE mice here. So four weeks, about 60 to 70% of aneurysm growth going on here. And we've been treating those mice with lenvatinib, which is a drug already used uh, in cancer treatment in the clinical setting. We're trying to repurpose that to aneurysm based on antigenesis, based on smooth muscle cell activity. And when we actually do um, this start an, an oral treatment at day seven, so with this already established aneurysmatic lesion, uh, we can see a nice complete halt of aneurysm growth, basically. And we've then taken this also further and started to mimic some endovascular treatment on those mice. So performing a reoperation on day seven, introducing um, lenvatinib into the already established aneurysm, you can basically see the very same effect. So complete halt of this aneurysm growth. And, uh, and now coming back, to my initial point. So what we see here, we have an aneurysmatic lesion, we treat it and we see some very nice uh, regression of this aneurysmatic phenotype. And this is of course, of course all based on um, at different levels here. So to conclude our opinions on the mouse models as stated in our review, um, 
there are a lot of mouse models available, uh, available. They are very valuable for translational research, but you have to consider that each of them is mimicking a very specific feature um, of, of what is probably the nature of human disease. Angiotensin is, of course, best domesticated, it's most used. Um, you have to consider that it's a very uh, prominent aortic dissection going on here. The, the, the hemorrhage is, is um, appearing in the, in the aneurysm wall, actually, or in the aortic wall. Um, and something that's a point that also um, even, even Alan Dagerty's group is trying to stress now that reporting standards should be keep so we know that in, in the angiotensin model, there is actually four different types of aneurysms for different ways that the aneurysm develops which is currently not reflected in, in none of the studies we're seeing or we're reading, basically. So I think this is something uh, that really needs uh, to be considered a bit more. Um, PPE, we think, is a very good mimicry of human disease. Of course, it's certainly challenging. You don't see rupture. You don't see any intralinear thrombus here. Um, so that's a limitation. Um, some of that stuff is better covered by putting elastase on the outside um, of the aorta, actually, where you do see rupture, where you do see some thrombus. So we're curious to see what happens here at different time points and how, how well this actually reflects um, what happens in humans. I'm stressing this point a lot. So the specific timeline of, of the development of the aneurysmatic lesion in those mouse models, that's very crucial to actually look at really translational. Um, results here, and I've spared this point. We've done some good work with Craig Gordon uh, from, from Purdue University to actually do different sorts of high resolution imaging on those mouse models, on those aortas. And we think that uh, those mice can be very nicely used here and with some limitations also for endovascular um, treatment. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I'm, of course, also very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for your presentation, uh, uh, Dr. Bush. Uh, very interesting to see. I like this slide where we put all the models together. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, so um, I have um, one question. Um, do you think that the current um, available mouse models are sufficient to mimic the human disease? And uh, well, go ahead with that. Well, yeah, so I've, I've never invented a mouse model, so I think it's quite hard to come up <laughs> with something that actually would mimic all that, um, all that stuff. I think what we know from human disease, of course, we don't know anything about the origin of, of aneurysm development. Um, I think the available mouse models, they all have some very good features, but you would also want to combine two or even more mouse models, and I'm stressing this point, so really look at the time point of interest. Um, of course, you will lose this very dynamic steep increase in the beginning, but I guess that's something that needs to be considered. That, 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 yeah, it's a good answer. That is you no know, one more than that that can replicate you know, or answer all of this, the research questions. So do you see any place for, or where do you see the place for large animal models in AAA? Um, yeah, so, so we've been we've been using the PPE model in a in a, in a preclinical um, pig model as well. Um, so I think this is something that actually has a place, um, also in in translational and in basic research, not only for for uh, putting different sorts of prosthesis um, into pigs. So you would also want to have an organism that mimics that mimics human a bit more closely, so having the same blood volume. Having a bit more different, having a bit more similar uh, genetics, and also being able to perform probably some endovascular interventions. Um, so I showed you what we did in mice. So we would also introduce the aneurysm in a pig, and then actually put a drug-coated balloon in there and try to influence aneurysm growth um, in those large animal models, which of course can't be done in in mice or can only be mimicked in mice very limitedly. Um, so I think there is a place, but of course it's cost expensive. It needs it needs more planning. There's ethic considerations, um, but I guess there will be a, a bigger and bigger place in the future for that. I really appreciate. Thank you so very much for your presentation. I um, unfortunately we have more questions, but uh, we will try to direct this to you. But we need to move uh, along right now, and uh, I will pass then um, the lead to Dr. Dark.
Yeah. First, I'd like to just thank Dr. Tran, Dr. Dukas, Dr. Bush. Uh, magnificent talks. Those are really fantastic and very exciting. But now it's my privilege to introduce our keynote invited speaker, Dr. April Boyd. Dr. Boyd is a vascular surgeon scientist and professor of surgery at the University of Manitoba. Dr. Boyd graduated from Queens University and completed a master's and PhD degree in physiology at the University of Toronto, where she also completed her MD, her general surgery and her vascular surgery training. She's internationally known as a star in the world of vascular surgery, and she has served as the president of the Canadian Society for Vascular Surgery. She is an expert in the pathophysiology and hemodynamics of aneurysms and their development, and her research focuses on developing a better understanding of the factors that lead to aneurysm formation and growth and ideally will one day actually tell us how to uh, precisely predict aneurysm rupture. Her research uh, was selected, as we saw from Dr. Dukas, was selected for the cover of the JVS Vascular Science inaugural issue, and she currently serves on our editorial board. Dr. Boyd. Wow, Alan, thank you for that amazing, <laughs> I don't know if so true introduction, but thank you. Again, thank you, Alan, for inviting me. Thank you, every from everyone from the JVSVS, for the invitation. It's my pleasure to talk about gaps and needs in AAA basic science research. I have no disclosures, and I think it's important to bring this out, but I do have a disclaimer, and the disclaimer is that I'm going to be presenting what I believe to be the next steps in research. Uh, basic science research of abdominal aortic aneurysms based on our work. Uh, I will touch on the work of others and what I think is coming along in the pipeline, but within 10 minutes, I can't cover it all. I just want to highlight the things that interest us the most. So as Dr. Dukas showed, we really got interested in looking at computational fluid dynamics and aneurysms after a VREC meeting eons ago, I think in the early uh, stages where Ron Dahlman was speaking about understanding aortic tissue means understanding flow along with the tissue. And I remember coming back very excitedly to my husband and my research partner, who is an engineer and the head of mechanical engineering at the university where we currently are. And I said, do you think you could model flow in an aorta? And that was a big question is what, what's an aorta? And we started there and we've come so far graduating students and it's been quite enjoyable research. But what we set out to do was to see if we could correlate flow dynamics with what has been known as standard sort of static wall pressure, um, finite element analysis, analysis of local wall stress, not wall shear stress and rupture location. And when we started, we thought, okay, we're gonna do computational fluid dynamics and we're going to show that our aorta's rupture exactly where there's dominant flow impingement and that'll correlate with the finite ele element wall stress data. And three patients in, we thought something really funny here. The red arrows indicate the location of dominant impingement, but the ruptures were not occurring in that location. And ruptures were also occurring where there was more interluminal thrombus, which kind of puzzled us. And then I began to read the work of VORP, who stated that, you know, where interluminal thrombus is deposited, there may be relative hypoxia, there may be a higher inflammatory signal, there may be something. And it was quite a surprising finding for us, and it has led us down a very interesting path. Now I'm going to get very clinical with everybody for a moment. This is a case of a most unfortunate 78 year old gentleman. He had a five centimeter aneurysm and he was being followed by a vascular surgeon in a tertiary center. He is, his aneurysm about six months earlier was five centimeters and he was scheduled to undergo a repeat ultrasound. And once he reached 5.5, he was going to be considered for repair. He presented to his local rural emergency department that happened to have a CT scanner and they ran him through the scanner when he presented with abdominal pain. They couldn't see anything. His pain kind of settled with some narcotics and he was sent home. He returned four days later and a repeat CT scan was performed which showed no interval change in the size of his aneurysm. The radiologist now reported a subtle sign in the interluminal thrombus and the interluminal thrombus is shown by this dotted line that is running around the outside edge, showed a blush of, of contrast going into the thrombus and you could also see sort of speculation of the, of the contrast as well, traveling through we what now know are canaliculi within the thrombus. They could not, they didn't report this, but you can see that it's actually starting on day one and this is day four. And 
would have been a massive lawsuit in every other country in the world, probably Canada. The man was sent home again. He had a collapse five days after the four day point. So nine days into the start of his symptoms. And he was taken to the hospital, same old hospital that now did a scan to rule out an aortic dissection. Anyway, he finally had surgery. He had an uneventful repair. He died two years later of heart failure. And he gave me permission to use his films posthumously for understanding aneurysm rupture. I find it very interesting that we believe and we see that aneurysms tend to rupture through thrombus. An autopsy study showed that 80% of patients who present with rupture that did not undergo surgery and, and rupture was found at autopsy had ruptured through an area that was heavily layered with interluminal thrombus. And it made us believe we're on to something because what are the chances of all the cases where I would have someone have three discrete time points, I'd happen to pick up an aneurysm that actually ruptures through the thrombus if they don't tend to rupture through thrombus. So that go, got us going in one direction. This is the same patient. And the interesting finding is we see calcification on the outer wall. Here's a renal cyst that sort of gives us the same level of landmark. There was a loss of calcification in the aorta even before it began to expand. There was a small bleb formation on the outer wall of the aneurysm shown in the red circle. And one of the more remarkable things is with symptoms, the aneurysm didn't change size until rupture. And what bothers me about that is almost all ruptures I've taken care of in males are about eight centimeters in size. Were they eight centimeters in size the day before they ruptured is my concern. We may be operating on aneurysms that were smaller at the moment of rupture than they appear to be when we meet the person with rupture. Now, it's only one case, but it is a concerning finding. And again, we showed that rupture occurred in a zone of recirculation flow. So we're quite interested in interluminal thrombus, but it, its role is controversial. It's, it's in almost every aneurysm. There's some early um, engineering work that shows that it might be reducing wall stress. And I can believe that as in most physiologic systems, something initially provides some protection, but then it continues to be deposited. There continues to be remodeling, expansion, angulation, and you get more of it deposited. And then it may go from protective to something that is more detrimental and may cause outer wall ischemia. Active cellular structures and proteases, like <laughs> interluminal thrombus isn't uh, sort of it's, it has active cells in it. They don't show any signs of apoptosis. They're active macrophage populations living within thicker layers of interluminal thrombus. It varies based on the region with very active cells in the more sort of blood-like layer, more neutrophils, et cetera, and less cellular content as you move outward in the thrombus. Aneurysms may lead to degeneration, uh, sorry, interluminal thrombus may lead to degeneration in animal models. Uh, there's some evidence of that. And of course, as I said, hypoxia. As Dr. Duke has showed, MMP9 levels are elevated where there's high interluminal thrombus. And based on Dr. Dukas's work, we saw that there was quite an inflammatory infiltrate. So our student, Matt Levesque, who's our brand new PGY1 as of July 1st, who will be starting in vascular surgery direct entry program, looked at uh, PG, um, sorry, IL-8 as a marker of neutrophil involvement in the wall. And again, we saw that higher ILT had higher neutrophils. The interesting thing and not shown here is that monocytes, uh, sorry, pardon me, macrophages were no different. We used MCP-1 as a marker of macrophage infiltration and could find no difference in different regions of high and low interluminal thrombus. So there may be something quite exciting going on with neutrophils in particular at least in relation to interluminal thrombus. So what are the gaps? Well, my point is if only, I think almost any non-engineer could finish this bridge if they had to, they'd find some way to do it, but that's not what's happening in basic science, AAA research. We get a very exciting finding in a mouse and it, we start building a very strong scaffold to do a, a human study. We don't really know where we're going, but we're getting some really nice, impressive structure built. And then many bridges end up looking like this. We go no further because we don't find the same thing happening in the human population. And we need to find ways to find where the bridge is going. And the more we do, the more we'll understand. And we need to bring in so many areas. 
So what do we need to do? This is an extremely busy slide and I apologize for it, but it's my mind map of what's going on and where do we need to work. Now, I'm not going to be doing research on every one of these areas, but I think computational fluid dynamics is a really important part of understanding aneurysms, but you need to mesh that with the solid mechanics and you also need to be able to look at fluid structure interaction. Most of the modeling we do is on rigid walls. We need to model, uh, and we, although we do model pulsatility, pulsatility in a receptive wall, particle deposition, that type of research needs to continue. I was most impressed by Dr. Tran's research today. That's the type of stuff we're talking about. If you have projection of uh, fenestrated limbs into the lumen of an endograft, are you getting more thrombus deposition? Is that, your is that the reason why, sorry, why stents thrombose? That's interesting research and a good application. Geometry is another area of interest. There's a paper that we presented at the SVS, not by our group, but by another Canadian group that believes that the more your aneurysm deforms, the less likely it is to rupture. It is a adaptive response. And then if you don't have as much deformation, you have higher risk of rupture. We've yet to look at this with our patients. Popliteal artery aneurysms. Well, why look at that if we're talking about inferenal aneurysms? Patients have similar genetic profiles, will have an aneurysm behind the knee. And in fact, if you have bilateral popliteal aneurysms, you have a high risk of having an infrenal aneurysm, but their behavior is different. Their MMP9 level is slightly different. Their MMP2 level is very different. So they seem to be forming in the same person, but one tends to rupture and one tends to embolize. In understanding the differences between these two types of aneurysms, you get insight into what's going on in inferenal aneurysms specifically. We, tend to we intend to continue looking at interluminal thrombus, and I'm happy to see Dr. Bush's work. I'm really in need of an animal model of, that, of something that is other than death, because most of the aneurysm models we have in mice is an aggressive chemical injury to the wall that if untreated in these mice will resent, result in rupture in almost every case. So we need a larger animal with more stable aneurysm formation over time to get a better sense of what's going on. It just depends on how we're going to induce that. And um, I'm leaving that to other experts. The same with genetics. Genetics won't be, does your loved one have an autosomal dominant, you know, Marfan's like transmission. It'll be way more specific into the mechanisms of collagen and elastin failure in, in patients' aneurysms. Risk factor modification. We all know that aneurysm incidence is going down and I do, do believe it's a direct reflection of a decrease in smoking. However, uh, pot is legal in Canada from coast to coast, and we are seeing a significant increase in smoking. It isn't, doesn't matter what you smoke, it's the fact that it's on fire and the products of combustion are associated with aneurysm formation. I think we'll never be out of business. Medical treatment is important, but to date, not one single drug that we have tried has halted the progression of an aneurysm's growth. But if we don't understand the core biology of the wall, we will never come up with a proper medical treatment. Sex differences, I think it's important because just like popliteal aneurysms, where there are differences, there is understanding. And I think because aneurysms in wet men and women behave slightly differently, that especially in looking at tissues, that's where we may get some answers and be able to target and prevent aneurysm expansion. Tissue analysis is important. We're going to continue with that, uh, looking at differences in uh, factors related to neutrophil infiltration. Can we block things in animal models? Will that halt the progression of an aneurysm? And then finally, endovascular repair. If you do an open repair, the aneurysm is treated. Uh, it, unless you sewed too far from the renals, you're fine. The patient may get a hernia in the future, but you're not going to be concerned about their aneurysm or any suprarenal um, type of aneurysm forming. But when you put an endograft in someone eight years down the road, there's remodeling. And it's not the type two endoleaks that are getting you. It's 1A and 1B. There's remodeling. There's change. What is the effect of radial force on an aneurysm neck over time? in a process that is inflammatory, even though there's no aneurysm at the neck, you seem to induce one over time. And that's also an area that we're quite interested in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Boyd.
that was really fantastic. We could talk for an hour about it, but given the time, I'm just going to ask you two quick questions. Number one, I'm sure everybody on this webinar wants to know what you think of the doxycycline trials, and that's still a gap, and why, why didn't it work? Did we translate it wrong? What happened? Um, I think it's just the animal isn't, although we are all animals, we all came from the original plant or the original cell. There's something different in animal models and the things that we find, the aneurysm is just too simple in the model. It doesn't take into consider, consideration all the factors. And I, I cannot answer why it isn't working in humans. I'm excited about the possibility of metformin as having a uh, diabetes as a negative risk factor for the development of an aneurysm. Could we stabilize the growth of aneurysms using metformin? I don't know, but that's something coming on the horizon. So far, it's very sad. I'm from the days of propranolol when the K. Wayne Johnson and the big propranolol trial was out. And I remember being quite junior and thinking, this is going to be amazing. There'll be no more aneurysms. I really bought into it. And then, of course, it didn't go anywhere. Thank you. And let me just ask one final question. I know this question's in the chat, but one final question. You told us all about the thrombus and you yeah. really convinced me. That's fantastic. And I agree. David Vorp did some seminal work in this, continues to do work in it. It's done great work in Pittsburgh, but you did the work on CFD and made that relationship. How does intraluminal thrombus get started? And can you predict that with CFD? Yes, you can. So we have, uh, I believe that the deformation happens first. So it's a chicken and egg thing. I believe that there's a change in elastin and collagen that causes deformation. Deformation, just like when a river widens or when you have an abnormal angulation, there'll be a widening of the river stream, a zone of recirculation and a dominant flow stream through it. So we have seen in aneurysms that we followed over time that for the most part, they tend to continue to deposit their thrombus in the same location. But if there's an angulation change in the neck, it's almost like a fire hose being pointed in a slightly different direction. And we've seen the other side of the aneurysm fill up with a change in, in neck angulation. So it's dynamic. And we've also seen that that thrombus in rare circumstances goes away. And that is an interesting thing. So if it's so important, where did it go? And how is it not embolized? And it did go away, you know, so subclinically that it didn't become an issue. So it's a little more active than we, we realized. And maybe a little similar to uh, uh, Alex Clue's concept of plaque regression. It can happen in the vascular system. Maybe. Oh, well, thank you very much, Dr. Boyd. And I want to thank again all the speakers very much. I want to thank all the participants, uh, everybody who asked questions. This was really wonderful. And I'll just ask Dr. Glavitsky, our editor in chief, to close the webinar. Well, uh, this was a great webinar. And I, was, uh, I really wanted to ask April what's currently the best predictor of rupture, uh, because I think uh, we shouldn't go away from here, April, unless you tell us what is the best predictor currently of rupture. Well, we know from animal models that saccular aneurysms have more interluminal thrombus, more disturbed flow. And we know when we see them, we operate on them. That's sort of the rule because they're higher risk to rupture. I, I still have to go with size because so much of the data has been about size and I'm going to continue to use size. But I tell you, when I see a crescent sign in an aneurysm, when there's a little bit of contrast leaking into the interluminal thrombus, radiologists used to tell vascular surgeons, oh, that's a concerning sign. And most of us went, yeah, sure. You know, didn't pay much attention, but, but now I actually do. I do pay attention to that crescent sign. Wow, that's wonderful. I think it was really a, a great hour. We, we, uh, we have heard and seen some... Uh, beautifully illustrated uh, great presentations uh, um, at this international summit. And uh, Dr. Boyd uh, gave a wonderful lecture. Thank you very much. I would like to call your attention that there is a JVS webinar on Wednesday, June 9th. So all of you who came and listened to this should come to our next uh, webinar on June 9th. Wednesday. Thank you very much for coming. Mm -hmm.